ready, we are going to begin our next presentation, which is the key to raising capital of the art of storytelling. We have somebody from outside of the theater industry here to share his raising money expertise and how to really pitch to those investors. Um, Neil Shinoy is the CEO and co-founder of Begin, which is a parent company of the Speakaboos and Homer Early Childhood Literacy and Language Learning Programs. He has experience across industries, and we are so lucky to have him here today. So please welcome to the stage, Neil Shinoy. Uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for, for having me. I, I appreciate it, and looking forward to talking to you about something that I know is uh, is deeply connected to what all of you do on a day in and day out basis, and that is storytelling. Uh, but as importantly, to relate our ability to tell stories uh, to running a business, and ultimately, in this case, raising capital. So my, my hope for you today, and we'll refer to you as the heroes, and that will make a little bit more sense as we as we progress throughout the presentation. But my hope for you today as our heroes um, is to help you on your journey of becoming a great, and if not better, storytellers. And for me, as your mentor or your guide, I have had the pleasure of telling stories uh, since ever someone was willing to listen to me. And that started in middle school when I was the, the first seventh grader to run for uh, class president and lost. Uh, it later served me. It was okay. I started with a little bit of loss. Uh, it motivated me. Um, storytelling came in handy in high school when I convinced my parents uh, to let me date the girl of my dreams. Um, it served me when I became president of my high school uh, and then president of my college. But most importantly, um, after graduating from school and working on Wall Street and starting five businesses, uh, it helped me to raise about $250 million of capital across those businesses over the past 20 odd years. Um, and storytelling was really a critical component of that success. So today, um, from a roadmap perspective, what my, my hope is to be able to traverse uh, over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, uh, these five things. We want to talk about the psychological and cultural importance of storytelling. I want us to internalize or reflect for a moment on why storytelling is so important. Again, in your craft, you appreciate this. I want to put that within the framework of business and raising capital. The second is having explained that or established that, we want to talk about what the elements of a good story are at a very foundational level. We want to talk about how to write a good story, what the components of that are, um, how to tell your story, and then as importantly, how to prepare once you've written your story um, from a practice perspective so you can really um, deliver the best presentation possible. So, uh, how many of you have, have seen this movie? All right. So if you are disqualified from these questions. For those of you that have, have not seen this movie and appreciating the power of the movie poster or the trailer, tell me what uh, feelings um, this evokes in terms of uh, how this makes you feel or specifically what you think this is about. And just shout out the answers. Innocent. A 40 year old virgin. A 40 year old virgin, yes, yes, you can read. <laughs> uh, innocent, someone said innocent. Oh, expectation. Expectation, right, in terms of uh, his, his face. George. Steve Carell's face. What else? Self-doubt. Self -doubt. That's right, maybe a little bit of concern. What else? Naivety. Naivety, okay, wonderful. How many of you have seen this movie? Exactly, I'm pretty sad. Um, now, but I, I use that as an example. Not knowing much about this movie at all, again, what do, what do these few words uh, and this image of, uh, I think it's Aaron Eckhart, um, actually evoke. What, what are the feelings you get? Darkness. Darkness, right, very dark. Beast. A beast, a monster. Fear. Fear. Fear, that's right. And it, this, is a, this is a comedy, this is a horror, what do you think it is, action? <laughs> I think maybe it ended up becoming a comedy, we're not sure. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that um, we have, through the power of stories, in this case, and the power of images to convey a story, the ability to convey a tremendous amount of information in a very, very simple format. And that's what the art of storytelling ultimately is. And to, to sort of explain that, when investors oftentimes invest in a business, they're not really investing in the business. They're investing in the story of the business. And I say that because in the limited amount of time that you spend with an investor, there's no conceivable way that they will ever understand your business, your ability, and your plan as well as you could. So to some degree, they are investing through a shortcut 
in the story of your business, what they understand about the business that you're creating. By the way, we all know this because for those of us that have been in a relationship or are in a relationship, we rarely date the person. We generally date the idea of that person. How many of you have dated the idea of a person only to find the story is slightly different? <laughs> so. But to put, put, put that in context, when you're on a first date, um, you are creating, either based on what you're told or what you see, a story of that person. How do they dress? What school do they go to? Are they unemployed or employed? Um, do they have fine manners? Can they carry a conversation? Um, do they seem ambitious? Are they polite? Are they kind to you? And based on that, you are making certain conclusions about what you do or what you not do next. You don't know much about that person, but you're idealizing and you're building a story about that person. And that can be very, very powerful in the initial interactions that you have to at least get to the point where hopefully you do learn about who that person really is. So the importance of storytelling from the standpoint of culture and from the standpoint of our society is that stories enable us to do really three things. And I want you to really deeply internalize and meditate on this. They enable us to take highly complex and nuanced information and do three things. Communicate that information in a way that's relatable, that's credible, and easily shared. Relatable means that people can actually understand and empathize with what you're telling them. Credible means that it's believable, and you're believable. And easily shared means it's memorable enough that they can tell your story. So as you are telling your story or your pitch, whether it's via email, in person, or via presentation, at the very least, the three things that your presentation, your story have to be able to do, it's a high, hur it's a high hurdle, despite being three words, is highly relatable, highly credible, and easily, easily shared. That's tough to do. We'll talk a little bit about how to do that. So what are the components that make a good story? We're going to borrow a little bit from Joseph Campbell. And what we'll talk about is that the main components of a story are a <coughs> likable hero. We'll talk about who that hero is in a moment, that has a desire. A roadblock that maybe precludes that hero from achieving that desire. And ultimately, upon the conclusion of that story, or that hero following the journey, that hero emerges transformed. So again, a hero with a desire, a roadblock that precludes that hero from achieving their desire, at least perceptionally. And finally, the hero emerges transformed. So, how many of you have seen The Karate Kid? Okay. Um, who is the hero in this image? Daniel Sun. Actually, that's technically true. The audience is the hero in this story. And what I mean to say by that is that the audience is brought into an ordinary world through the eyes of Daniel Sun and Mr. Miyagi. There's a call to adventure in this ordinary and mundane world. They see a reluctant hero, a version of themselves in Daniel Sun, who again has a desire, but has obstacles. Guidance of a mentor in this case, Mr. Miyagi, at the end of the story, both Daniel's son as the character and you are transformed. So one of the biggest mistakes that we make is that we are not the hero. You could be in a presentation with an investor and say to yourself, I have to be the hero. I have to be the superhero that this investor is betting on. And instead, what I urge you to do is to consider that investor or that partner as the hero. And your responsibility as the mentor is to guide them through the journey and help them to be transformed. From the ego perspective, if people can actually believe that they are on the journey that you yourself are conducting, it's a very, very powerful device. So most good stories, as we're told, and as I'm sure as you've done in, in, in much of your craft, have a beginning, middle, and an end. We're going to nuance that a little bit and talk about what the secret arc of great storytelling is. And I'm going to borrow this from a, a wonderful uh, sociologist named Nancy Duart. Um, one of the things I'm going to urge you to do, I'm going to give you some homework after this, is to watch a TED Talk by Nancy Duart, 15 minutes. It's worth uh, every moment of those 15 minutes. And what she talks about when she 
uh, traces the arc of presentations from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech to Steve Jobs' introduction of the iPhone, and she finds a very similar pattern in storytelling, which is that you begin with a description of the status quo, the ordinary. And as that presentation or as that speech continues, you are effectively painting a picture of what is possible or what the future could hold. And you're alternating between the mundane and the today and the possible. And this rhythm of going back and forth between where we are today and where we want to be is a tremendously powerful device in storytelling. And if you listen to the I Have a Dream speech or the introduction to the iPhone, you'll see the very powerful rhythm and alternation between these two points for, in this case, the audience or the hero. So I'm going to modify that a little bit, and we're going to put that, put that into perspective in a moment. There is oftentimes a credibility gap between where the ordinary exists in the status quo and where ultimately you want to lead your audience, in this case, the investor. And part of your responsibility as you alternate between the status quo and the potential is to close that credibility gap. To paint a picture of a world in which, for example, phones are not merely just phones, but phones are devices by which to play games and have video conferences and hail cars and book uh, restaurant reservations, but to show to them that this is actually possible. This is credible. And actually the gap between what's possible and what's impossible um, ultimately is closed by you. So, the key element to remember here is that the audience is the hero of your story. Whoever you are presenting to is the audience of your story. And your responsibility is to show them what is possible, and most importantly, how to achieve it. Even though this is your company, your play, your movie, your film, you want them to be transformed by your journey. That's when it gets very, very powerful, and that's when people give you a lot of money. So, uh, let's talk about what the devices for the construction of a good story are, and this is borrowing from uh, Aristotle. There are three elements of a great story. Pathos, ethos, and logos. Let's be specific and define terms here. Pathos is the heart. It is why you should care. So an example of a pathos or pathos-based statement is that the consequences of not acting on climate change is that wonderful million dollar apartment you've bought in Manhattan is going to be underwater in 2030. So that's why you should care. That's why I am hopefully connecting with you at the level of something that should really resonate with you in terms of its impact or consequence or opportunity. Pathos is why you should care. Ethos is why you should be believed. It is your credibility. And so an example of ethos is a study in the New England Journal of Medicine demonstrated a link between eating carrots and cancer. They didn't, but just in case. <laughs> the point is, I am pointing to credibility and research and third parties as an example of demonstrating that what I'm about to tell you is anchored in fact. It is why you should believe me. And logos, which is the last component, is the plan. It is your blueprint of how you're going to get from point A to point B. An example of that is that data shows that 90% of accidents do not end fatally if you drive below 40 miles an hour. That's my plan to solve uh, this problem. So pathos is the heart. It's why you should care. Ethos is the brain. It's why you should believe. And logos is the plan or the spine. It is how we're going to get from point A to point B. Now, let me ask you, when you are telling a story, which of these three things is the most important? What do we think? How many people think that pathos is the most important? Okay. How many people think that ethos is the most important? And finally, how many people think that logos is the most important? Okay. Most of you have said, which is very natural, that logos or the plan is the most important. And that, my friends, is the exact opposite of how to tell a story or raise capital. And here's why. Um, part of our bias as entrepreneurs, as creators, as people that have a vision, is that we obsess 
day in and day out about our plans, our schedules, our hiring, our vision. And we believe that if they just knew how much we cared, how much we knew, how much we obsessed, they would back me. They would put money behind me. But the fact of the matter is the person you're sitting across from the table doesn't care at this point in time in your initial conversations. And so what you want to do in your initial storytelling is spend 60% of your time on pathos, getting them to listen and connect to you. And once you've done that, you want to spend about 30% of your time saying, if you believe in what I'm telling you, if you rather enjoy or connect with what I'm telling you, let me tell you why you should bet on me as a horse, why you should believe me. And if you do those two things, the plan, at least initially, matters a lot less. Said differently, if I was having a conversation with Elon Musk, and Elon Musk says, I have created a teleportation machine, I really don't care what his plan is. But if Elon Musk has told me, as a credible human being, that he's built a teleportation machine, I'm probably going to take that meeting and listen. I might even put some money behind that. So applying the pathos, ethos, and logos structure to storytelling, or the modified storytelling arc that I've shared, results in the following. When you are describing the ordinary, the mundane, and the possible, you are using pathos to believe to do that. Martin Luther King said, this is where we are today, this is where we could be. Do you want to be where I want to be? He appealed to our hearts, ultimately, to connect with us. And then, what he used, rhetorically, were opportunities for ethos and logos that there's a credible messenger, a credible opportunity, and a reasonable plan, in essence, to be able to get there, to close that credibility gap. But mind you, pathos is the most important thing, especially in a society where we have very short attention spans. Not a lot of things matter to us anymore. So pathos is the beginning of the Pathos is the, the beginning, sorry. Oh, there you go. Pathos is the beginning. Pathos is also a part of what the future holds. It's not necessarily from the standpoint of when you tell the story. Of course, you should crystallize, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but pathos is where you are and where you want to go from a device perspective. So let's, let's put some of this in practice and give you guys some examples, again, some frameworks to apply to each of your projects and your businesses. So we're going to talk a little bit about a high concept pitch. Um, we'll call that an elevator pitch, a log line. We're going to talk about um, the elevator pitch itself. We're going to talk about presentations. So um, this is a little bit out of my world of, of tech. The first two are not as much. The third one is. So the third one will be really tough. Uh, most people in tech don't even know. But if I told you that there's a movie out there where the log line is, his story will touch you even though he can't, what movie is that? What's that? Boy in the Bubble, that's a good example. Other examples? I usually hear Ghost. Um, the, the actual answer is that's Edward Scissorhands. Um, but the point is, you're conveying a tremendous amount of information in less than 10 words. Now, um, if I told you there was a product that was released a few years ago that was Instagram, but for video, what product would that be? Snapchat. Snapchat. Now it'd be Snapchat. Well, a few years ago, it's a little bit tough because this is outdated. It'd be Vine. Vine, right? So again, a tremendous <laughs> amount of information is being conveyed in a few words. And why is that important? Because again, the art of storytelling is conveying highly complex information in a way that is relatable, credible, and memorable. And so specifically, when I tell someone that, hey, I just met these guys and gals <laughs> that are creating Instagram for video, Think about what I am communicating in just a handful of words. A tremendous amount of credibility. Instagram is huge. It's a multi-billion dollar business. For a video, it's a big market opportunity, and anyone can remember that story. So the power of your log line is ultimately that in the fewest words possible, how much can you convey, again, the relatability, the credibility, the opportunity, um, of your specific idea, as well as making it memorable enough that they can effectively be your messenger as well. Uh, this is an elevator pitch again for a technology company, but the example um, will, will hold true. Let me read this. Uh, Ning, you won't remember this because it wasn't ultimately that successful. Ning lets you create your own social network or anything for free in two minutes. It's as easy as starting a blog. 
Try it here, Ning.com. We built Ning to unlock the great ideas from people all over the world who want to use this amazing medium in their lives. We have over 115,000 user-created networks and our page views are growing 10% per week. We previously raised 44 million from Leg Mason and others, including myself. Before Ning, I started Netscape. This is Mark Andreessen. Acquired AOL by AOL for 4.2 billion, and Opsware acquired by HP for 1.6 billion. I use this as an example because every single word in this very pithy email pitch has a purpose. There is no fat. There is nothing extra about this. Every single word serves a goal in terms of the pathos, ethos, and logos component of your early storytelling. So for example, when you say that Ning lets you create your own social network for anything for free in two minutes, that is the what, that is why ultimately you should care. That's a huge potential opportunity. It's as easy as starting a blog. That makes it relatable. It makes it something that you can understand and internalize if you don't exactly know what a social network ultimately is or how hard that is. Pointing to the URL makes it tangible, something that, again, you can relate to and that you can experience. When we talk about how we can have people all over the world using this amazing medium, we're talking about, again, from a pathos perspective, how profound this opportunity actually is. It is global. It is relevant. When we talk about the fact that we have 115,000 users growing 10% per week, we've raised $44 million. By the way, I sold a company for $4.2 billion. That is all ethos and credibility. It's why you should listen. This is not a plan. This is a reason to care in terms of pathos and a reason to believe in terms of ethos. And so again, if Mark Andreessen, with his success, is telling you that he's thought of a big idea, you're most likely going to listen. All of us have a little bit of Elon Musk and Mark Andreessen within us that we can sort of channel when we're telling our stories. So, when you're writing a good story, you, your story has to take the simplest path, the fewest words possible, using uh, empathy, credibility, and logic as your devices. The fewest words possible. Any words that are not necessary, any fact, dilute the purpose of the story or the pitch that you're attempting to give. So let's talk about preparation behind actually developing a good story. And there's five things that we're going to talk about. Number one, anticipation is everything. Number two, control the narrative. Number three, build planks in terms of how you convey information. Number four, think in threes. And number five, rinse, uh, sorry, content then delivery. So let's, give about, let's talk about some examples of this specifically. The first thing about preparation of your story in terms of anticipation is everything is that you have to meditate on what it is that the audience, in this case an investor, is going to want to know and what questions they're going to ask you. If you know what their questions are, you can ensure that your story addresses it. They're going to want to know what your idea is. They're going to want to know who you are and why they should believe you and why they should bet on you. And they may want to know a few elements of your plan. But anticipation is everything means is that what questions are they going to ask you and can you answer them before they ask, which by the way, heightens your credibility. It's like, okay, he or she already knows what I'm about to ask and they've already contemplated that. I believe them a little bit more. They've done this before. They are thoughtful. They are organized. Number one. Number two, you want to control the narrative when you're telling your story. One of the biggest mistakes that I see entrepreneurs make is they let the investor define what success looks like. Instead, you should define what success looks like. Here's what I mean. If you say, I am going to launch a play, and for me, what success means is securing the cast, finding a venue, and raising $500,000 in the next six months, you have now called your shot. You have now defined what success ultimately looks like. If you don't do that, you're letting the investor dictate what success looks like, which may be possible or impossible, something you're focusing on or something that you're not focusing on. Number three, build planks. One of the things that we want to do is to ensure that in a presentation, we get through everything. What's more important is to ensure that people understand the foundation of your information before you move on to the next point, and the next point, and the next point. So if your presentation has five sections, 
and you only get through three, but your investor understands those three far more powerful than having gone through five and then not having comprehended or understood that information. So one of the things we want to talk about is don't advance information until you're ensured that they understand the previous scaffolding or plank of information. Again, very common mistake. We just want to get through it. We want to make sure that they understand. Better to have understood than to have completed. Number four, you want to think in bullets. So when you think in bullets, you're organizing your mind, but you're organizing the mind of the investor as well. You're telling them that to solve this problem, we're going to do three things. My plan consists of four things. And then you're telling them what those three or four things are. You're building an outline for them, which is a framework of how to absorb information. When you're sharing so much information, again, complex information, your job is to simplify. And finally, one of the biggest mistakes that we all make is that we focus on delivery before we focus on content. And our brains are incapable of focusing on both. If you don't know your content, if you don't know your pitch, you cannot deliver it effectively. You cannot work on your body language, your eye contact, your tone, and your inflection. If you know your content well, you can then focus subconsciously on your delivery. So if you want to practice your delivery, focus on your content. Know it inside and out, and your delivery will be flawless, or at least better than it would be if you didn't appreciate that content and you're accessing and searching for that information. So being a good storyteller, again, comes back to preparation. And again, defining what your narrative is, anticipating questions, creating an outline ultimately for your presentation or story, organizing in bullets, testing that for logos, ethos, and pathos, and then practicing your content. Now, here's a very simple way that you can do that. You take a piece of paper and you fold it both vertically and horizontally, and now you have four quadrants. In your upper left-hand quadrant, I want you to write what your objective is. What are you trying to get out of that meeting? or from that investor, maybe a single sentence. The second thing that you want to do is you want to list all the ideally questions that you think they're going to ask you. What are they going to want to know? That's your second column, upper right-hand column, uh, or square, rather. Your lower left-hand square on that page is going to be your outline, your outline that delivers your story from the standpoint of meeting your objective and similarly answering those questions that you've anticipated. And you're now going to test that outline for pathos, ethos, and logos. And finally, you're going to take that outline and you're going to break down the sections of your outline into bullets. Three points, four points, or five points. <coughs> if you follow that model of constructing your presentation, the skeleton of your presentation, objectives in the upper left, anticipated questions in the upper right, outline in the lower left, and the substance through points in the lower um, right, um, lower left of the one previous, you will have constructed a wonderful outline that effectively helps you to organize your content according to this framework. So the final thing that we'll conclude on, and if we have a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll mention a few more things, is that delivery, once you've perfected your content, comes down to a few principles. When you are delivering, and hopefully you've seen some of this in this today's presentation, you are building roadmaps, you're building signposts, you're answering in the bullets that you've constructed in your outline, and then you are rinsing and repeating. And what do I mean by that? When you are building roadmaps, what I mean to say is you want to, in the famous saying, tell them what you're about to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. That is critical from the standpoint of this presentation. So if you recall, in the beginning of this presentation, I told you I was going to tell you, I then told you, at the end of the presentation, I'll crystallize that for you. Tell them what you're about to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you just told them. That creates the repetition and the comprehension that actually leads to the mastery or understanding of your presentation or your story. Number two, build signposts for them. Tell them where they are on the journey. First, we're going to talk about this. Second, we're going to talk about this. And finally, we're going to talk about this. So imagine that you are on a highway and you are building signs. First we're taking a highway, then we're taking an exit, then we're taking a road. Let them know where you are so that they can organize your presentation in a structure in their mind. Answer in bullets. Again, going similar to point two. If you've constructed your outline in bullets, refer back to those bullets. 
here's three things that I'd like you to do. Here's four things that my plan consists of. Here's two things that I see as potential problems. You are outlining and creating structure for them so they can better comprehend what it is that you're telling. And finally, rinse and repeat. Repetition is critically important. As you all know, if, you, if you've worked in advertising, uh, you have to tell people on average five to seven times the same fact for them to have retention and recall. Uh, it is critical that you do that in your storytelling, in your communications, ultimately, to make sure that the investor knows what you want them to know. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is a, a section that we typically do on how to answer questions from investors in the interest of time. I want to flip forward to, to one other um, aspect of the preparation uh, uh, presentation. Before we do that, in summary, telling a story takes preparation, it takes a highly organized mind, and it takes practice. You can't focus on content and delivery at the same time. Structure your mind, structure your presentation, and once you do that and you know the content, you'll be able to deliver that with a much greater level of effectiveness. So um, as you become better and better storytellers, you will graduate to the next level of storytelling, and that is the tools of persuasion. And one of the things I would highly recommend for everyone here, it was transformative for me, is a book uh, by a, a gentleman named Dr. Robert Caldini. Uh, he is a professor at Arizona State University, and he wrote a seminal text on the power of influence. It's called Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. And in there, he reduces the principles of persuasion, getting people to do, without the use of power, the things that you want them to do, into a handful of principles. I've outlined a handful of those. Um, I'm going to tease out an example of that, hopefully, to get you interested enough to read the book. So, one of the things that he talks about is the concept of reciprocal concessions. So the example that he gives is that he's walking down the street and he's approached by a Boy Scout. And the Boy Scout says, sir, um, we have a Boy Scout jamboree coming later this month. And we're selling tickets for $100. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, music there, all you can eat. Uh, are you free that weekend? And Robert feels horrible, because the last thing he wants to do is to spend $200 at a Boy Scout jamboree. He doesn't want to say no to the child. He says, listen, I apologize. I'm not going to be in town for that. Um, so I'm not able to attend. The boy looks forlorn. He looks sad. He says, OK. Well, you know, the other way that you can support is you can buy this $5 candy bar. And, Ro <laughs> and Robert says, you got it. Now, first of all, a $5 candy bar, not as much value as maybe an all-you-can-eat Boy Scout jamboree. But the point is, is that it's a reciprocal concession that took place there. The boy gave him permission to say no to the Boy Scout jamboree. And in return for that, in return for that concession, he was primed to say yes to the second request. And quite frankly, the second request is most likely the primary request. So th this book, by the way, is full of these wonderful um, stories and angles. I'll give you one more. There's a story about a gentleman named Joe Girard. He, at the time, I think in the 70s, was one of the top um, Chevrolet salesman, and he was phenomenal at selling Chevys. And so Robert misses him and said, what is, his, what is his science? What does he do? Is he a phenomenal storyteller? Does he have incentives? Does he put on great spectacles? And Joe Girard sits and talks about it. He goes, you know, I, I can't think of anything that makes me really remarkable, but I do one thing which I believe tips everything in my favor. Every holiday season, whether someone buys a car for me or simply visits me, I send them a thank you note and says, I liked you, I enjoyed meeting with you. And the principle there is that 50% of the challenge of getting people to do business with you or to give you money is that they have to like you. Because by doing something with you, it is a validation of what it is they already perceive about you. So again, this book, which will take you four hours uh, on a cold November or December evening, um, is a wonderful, wonderful applied book on the psychology of persuasion that you can use to be more effective storytellers and also to defend yourself from other people telling you stories. So, uh, my homework for you um, as a way to reinforce this, this is generally, so you all know, I want to do this at universities or for corporations um, or for classrooms, three hours. So I apologize that it's been quite rapid. Um, and we usually do a lot of practice along the way. But uh, since we only have 35 minutes, um, here's your homework. Number one, I would like for you all to listen to I Have a Dream. And as you listen to the first pass of I Have a Dream, ask yourself how you feel. What is the pathos of that presentation or that speech? The second is I want you to listen to it again. And this time, I want you to listen to it 
to it through the, the lens of the rhythm and the arc of that. Is there an alternation, as we've talked about, between the status quo and the profound? You can do the same exact thing if you prefer with Steve Jobs' um, I have a dream, I have an iPhone speech. If you had a dream with a laptop. Um, the third is write your high concept pitch, your elevator pitch, and write your outline, anticipate your questions, and ultimately practice those things. And finally, here are some of the references and sources that I mentioned. There's a presentation called um, The Secret Structure of Great Talks by Nancy Duarte. Um, the book is called The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Caldini. And then, uh, if you like, from a capital raising perspective, there is a free PDF written by a group called Venture Hacks that talks about storytelling and all the elements of storytelling as it relates to raising capital. And it's a very, very powerful practicum on how to put some of this stuff uh, to work. And then, uh, that's it. So thank you guys for, for, for listening. <laughs>
aware that we could watch your three-hour talks? I, I, I don't. I don't know that it's been filmed, um, or if it has. I, they didn't tell me. So, <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, not. Um, but if you if you do as a proxy for that, watch those two TED talks. If you do read the Influence book. Um, if you do, uh, in essence, download the Venture Hacks Guide to Pitching, that will pretty much give you a very, very intensive appreciation of all the principles that I've put forth in a much shorter format. Um, so I highly, rec I highly recommend that. There's one more TED Talk I would recommend. It's a TED Talk by a gentleman named Simon Sinek, and he talks about the psychology of how to connect with people on a limbic basis, and he talks about great brands like Apple and how they do that. Uh, the, TED, the, talk, uh, the TED Talk is actually labeled on leadership. It's what makes, lead, what makes successful leaders. Uh, that's very, very powerful as well. He has a concept called uh, the golden circle. And uh, again, from a storytelling perspective, really, really powerful. So if you watch those two or three TED Talks, again, the Influence book, and you read Pitching Hack, which has a lot of examples of how to do this, uh, that will be even more powerful, I think, than my three hours. I read a book called uh, Tell to Win by Paul Gruber. Did, have you ever read it? I have not. And you took it like an, a diff another level than he did, so I felt like it, it would be a better. <coughs> you, you did something else that I, that I hadn't read before, so sure. thank you. Absolutely. All right, we are at time for this. Um, thank you so much, Neil, for all those amazing insights. We really appreciate it. Get a glass of water if you need it, but we're going to be back in about five minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs>